Here with you, yeah, on a Monday, oh no, excuse me, a Tuesday night, Tuesday. the prize Tuesday night show. Yeah, we have a, a special guest on the show tonight. A guy that's been on the show before, it's been a while though. Uh, actor oh. Bill Mosley, it has been quite a long time. We had him on right before the release of Devil's Rejects. Him and Sid Haig joined us on separate occasions, and uh, by far one of the highlights of our time on terrestrial radio for myself because i am a huge horror fan and it, it was it was a ahead. highlight for other people as well you, you you make it sound like uh, no one else uh you know enjoyed having bill mosley on or anything like that you for myself i enjoyed the the meatloaf but uh, everyone else i speak for others when i say no one else enjoyed it but myself knox <laughs> I can't Hiya. believe you're here. Thank you so much. You know, this isn't just uh, a a uh, rare occasion of us doing an interview uh, last minute. It's also a huge occasion to have Knox on for an interview. Knox is uh, rarely uh, in the house for an interview, but tonight, tonight I could. The uh, thank you. And, and by the way, it's, Bill it's great to see you. Doesn't have breasts, by the way. Is is that the reason you're here? Bill has no breasts. <laughs> as we know yeah. of something like that but good to see uh the two of you and creed earlier as well that's uh been a while sorry it, it, it's just been busy i know everyone thinks it's impossible that i'm that busy but it's not works for the ups so. in case you were wondering it is the busy season for ups and we're just glad knox is here speaking of seasons mikey this is a you know this is a would this be a part of our halloween season kind of jumping into it, it? i mean it stores is. stores around america are putting out halloween stuff already so why don't we put out some halloween-esque style interviews and different things like that early correct? absolutely i mean you know I, I start booking uh as i like to call it shocktober uh very early on and uh i got you know, an offer to have Bill on immediately. So when you are offered something like that, and it's someone that you uh, is is definitely one of the the big horror icons, y you take it. Uh, just like we have an opportunity on Friday night coming up, we're going to have Kane Hutter on. If you don't know who Kane Hutter is, he is also a horror icon. He was uh, Jason Voorhees, basically from you know six on. He was, uh, you know, Jason Voorhees. He's played many other roles. He's in Hatchet. Uh, he wrote a book, and uh, he's still doing work. Still doing work. Uh, let's not forget White Fang, by the way. 
White Fang, yeah. Mr. Wow. Mosey was in White Fang as well. So he hasn't done he hasn't only he isn't a one trick pony. He's not only doing uh horror, he can do other stuff too. Voice acting. I know he's done some voice acting with uh he did a, I think a episode of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He's also done some uh, voice acting. I'll talk to him about a, a, a animated horror movie type deal that he has done that came out in March, but is now coming out on DVD in October. Uh, that's called, I believe it's, uh, what is the name of it? Oh, uh, To Your Last Death. It's an animated movie, but it's very gruesome. Very good stuff. So um, Halloween hopefully is not canceled this year. You can't cancel something that's in your heart. Can you take away the love of your life just because she's gone? No. <laughs> she's still deep in your heart. She's still pulling out those heartstrings. She's telling you what's what's going to happen next. And uh, if it's I have still to monologue, real to me. it's still real. You know, you look, I have a grandson now. I'm an old man here in, in, in this day and age. And I've already made a plan. If there is no uh, Halloween, we're still dressing him up. Uh, luckily, he lives in a 42-room mansion. And we're going to close all the doors and have somebody get behind each door, have him go to each door, knock, and get candy. 42 so, rooms? 42 rooms, Knox. Uh, that is no exaggeration. Um, so, you know, Halloween can still have a bish. I know you have children. Halloween, is it happening or not? 42 rooms or 42 doors? Do you think he lives in the Winchester mansion that has doors that go to nowhere? <laughs> I would, yeah, I want to hear this logic that you think that there's 42 then there's doors, doors with no rooms. With no rooms. No, Multiple but there could be, room. it could be, uh, you know, <laughs> well, right, so the, the, just some closets, uh, some some pantries, some, uh, you know. <laughs> right. That's well, the yeah. thing. What is, what is she doing in a house that big? Look, I can't tell kids how to spend their money. I mean, I just, you just do it, you know. If I get old, maybe I can hide out in one of them and they'll never see me. And they'll never see you, yeah. I mean, you know how long it takes to clean that place? I went to this room 18 years ago to, uh, you know, go trick-or-treating. Oh, wait, my grandpa lives here now. I didn't even know he was here. So, yeah, that's that's a good plan, Mikey. Look, you got to have an escape plan. You always have something in the back of your mind. A golden parachute. Yeah. So, you know, that's mine. Uh, I'm ready to get in there. Hustle, hustle, hustle. Uh, Bill will be joining us momentarily. We're not just sitting here uh, talking of our assets for nothing. Uh, he'll be joining us probably about four minutes. So if you're wondering where Bill Mosley is, that's not him up there in those small little circle. He will actually be joining us live, taking your questions, like the one Jason just had. I uh, see Jason's question over there, Bishop. Do you remember this scene that he speaks of? Uh, I do, very vividly. This is the one where uh, the chick from Three's Company, maybe you remember from there, when he uh, he takes his gun and puts it in a uh, a place you're not supposed to. The not the, the not Suzanne Summers chick. No, the, the other uh, girl, replace- the, the 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 brunette. Uh, the blonde that replaced her. She was the uh, replacement. There was the one that was kind of uh, really ditzy, and then there was the one that uh, on Three's Company, Jack was like really mean to her because he didn't want her to. Sk- to live there so he did a bunch of pranks to her her and uh you know they had like a run-in and then they started liking each other and then she was a part of the show i'm trying to remember what she was also in mall rats she had uh three boobs oh yes yes okay um, okay yeah thanks for clearing yeah. that one up we, we all were like oh yes yes yeah, the, the the three boobied she, woman from mall rats she had three boobs but well that is a very disturbing scene um, I'm, and you got to remember, I, I'm sure they didn't just film it one time. You got to do it from multiple angles and things like that. So that's a, that's a, something that's going to be very taxing. So, but I mean, she seemed like she was really into it, not like sexually, but into it as far as the, uh, acting <laughs> being Jesus Christ. Hey, uh, that guy's wow. name on there is a, is a cough net. Another word for a, for a mask, a cough Van, net, Van cough net, cough net. It's a mask. Hmm? What do you think? I think so. I great think it's pretty, it's pretty clever. Pretty if, clever. If it not is, bad. great job. If it's not, I'm sorry to offend you. Yeah, um, I'm sorry to offend your Romanian heritage. The Van Kovnet. Van Kovnet. They live next door to the Winchesters. But yeah. Next to um, the Van Helsings. Yeah. 
I'm so the listen, Mikey. I gotta tell you, I'm so glad that you set the interview up for 8:30, and you made sure that we got on at 7:45, uh, so we could be primed and ready. Do you know what Bill the on to talk about the, Bill coming on for 28 minutes, and then when Bill comes on, we'll say, "Well, Will, Bill, we talked all about <laughs> you coming on. It's great having you. Give it up for Bill Mosley, everybody." All right, Bill. Mosley. I was Bill thinking Bosley. about huh? Bill, Did you say Bill Bosley. <laughs> Bill Mosley. I think did he I did say Bosley, by the way. Oh, Mike. Oh, yeah. So Mikey said, uh, hold on. I'm, I'm going back to what it says. Uh, hard 815 start time. He said hard start. So that made sure we were here, Bish. That was like, okay, wait, shit, hard start. We better make sure we're there. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to say this more often. Nothing worse. Then, because it's hard to get people to understand that until we go live, till we start the the show in the background, you don't have a code to send them. So they want the code three hours ago, and so you're like, okay, you have to explain to them, hey, it's I'm not trying to hold you up, but it's not going to come until it's close to show time. So, and especially when you're dealing with an agent, you have to deal with a publicist or something like that. After it's like, you know me handing you a biscuit to hand bishop to hand creed you know so it's it's not as cut and dry as, is as normal. Biscuit wrapped while we're all handling it oh, no this is a barehanded biscuit um mm. is there anything on the biscuit that drippings uh like is there <sighs> jelly that is getting loose or or i believe the biscuit was very hot at the time and two pats of butter Two pats of butter. Oh, oh, uh, so this biscuit. I understand is, now. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. So you need to, you need to get it when you can get it. Quick. No matter what it is. I got you. I totally got you. But I am a, a huge fan of Bill's. Uh, I've watched a lot of his movies because I feel like if it's a Bill Mosley movie, I, I will get some enjoyment out of it. Even if everyone else in the film sucks, at least I will enjoy Bill's performance. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. No, that makes sense. He's like, you know, you're like, okay, well, this is, uh, he's, he's the two pads of butter is what you're saying. He is the two pads of butter in that very hot biscuit. Mm -hmm. Now, Mikey, you've been into horror movies and gore movies for like, since your childhood, right? Like this is like, I was thing. probably like, I'm going to say nine years old. I watched, uh, I'd watched a few films, you know, you'd hear kids on the school bus talking about, I just watched this movie called Nightmare on Elm Street. It's the scariest movie I've ever seen. So, of course, you know, you go to the video store, you look for that right away. Um, so, as a fan, I would say more of anything, I enjoyed being scared as a kid um, in a way that wasn't normal because it's not normal. But well, I'm also very anxious and have been since I was a kid too. So, I couldn't handle my parents wouldn't let me watch horror movies, I wasn't allowed to watch them at all. That was because they figured out would just go off the deep end. Well, no one kept track of me very well. Uh, when I went to the video store, my mom would basically let me have free run. And she would rent anything I asked. So anything you handed her, she would rent? Yeah, she didn't look at it twice. I could have handed her pornography. She wouldn't have looked at it twice. Um, you know, so I, at the time when you went to the video store, they would have all these posters everywhere. They'd have... Uh, like these little magazines you could take home with you, what uh, movies were coming out. And that's when video cassettes were like $85, $100 for a movie. Right. So like the late fee. Yeah. You weren't buying movies. You know, you had to rent them if you were going to watch them because nobody could afford to buy movies. They were insanely expensive, insanely expensive. So uh, it, it worked out great until I watched uh, the very first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which ruined me for quite a while. Well, with that uh, being said, uh, let's get on Mr. Bill Mosley, someone who uh, I think the star of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Two. Yeah. Give it up for, uh, once again, on the show, Bill Mosley, everybody. Yeah. Bill Mosley. <laughs> Look at this guy. Dog Will Hunt. That's right. Uh, I want to say thanks for coming on the show. We were just talking earlier about how you had been on the show before back in our terrestrial days, uh, right before uh, The Devil's Rejects came out. We had you on, and then not long after that, we had Sid Haig on as well, which I was just telling everyone, 
were highlights to me because I'm a huge horror fan, have been since like I was nine years old. And we were talking about how, you know, back then my mother would take me to the video store and let me grab anything off the shelf. She wouldn't look at it twice. As long as she was getting the movie she wanted, I'd get to see what I wanted. So I enjoyed all those films at an early age and kind of set me up for a what, fall. What kind, of, what kind of movies did your mom like? Uh, my mom was one of those people that you would uh, get to the house and then she would disappear. You didn't see her anymore. This was more like the babysitter. The babysitter was going to you know, hang out with me. I, I would hang out late nights watching uh, the Red Eye Cinema from the local uh, television. So I would see all the Vincent Price movies and things like that as a kid. So, you know, I, I, I got an appreciation for something like this. So when I think of you, what was the what was the roots that were set for you to become this kind of guy that you are? Uh, well, same thing. When I was a kid, um, you know, I, I basically uh, dared the wrath of my parents and I would sneak into the library where our old black and white RCA Victor TV was. And um, uh, actually, I think it was a Zenith um, and uh, and watch in Chicago. I come from outside of Chicago. We had something called Shock Theater which was uh, midnight Saturday night. It was kind mm -hmm. of a local, you know, I had one of those kind of groovy, gooly hosts and, yeah. uh, you know, little studio horror jokes between, uh, you know, takes of the movie. And uh, that's what I would do. I would, you know, I, I risked the wrath of my parents because if they had found me up, they would have spanked me um, yeah. back then, back in those good old days of corporal punishment. Exactly. <laughs> I got punished happen. a lot. Uh, but that's what that's that's how I really started my life. Also, my dad, who was a you know, Marine captain and, you know, a tough guy, football player, um, loved Halloween. And so every Halloween, even though he was a tough, strict guy, come Halloween, you know, he was a changed person. So I always, you know, equate Halloween with, you know, those happier times at home. Yeah. So and I love candy. All right, so you you were uh, almost like a military brat. Did you guys move around a lot? Uh, no, no. He he had he had long since left the corps, but he was uh, World War II and re up for Korea even oh, after wow. my brother and I were born. So he wow. must have either really, you know, loved war or <laughs> didn't he like, loved, didn't he, like loved horrors, he loved the horrors of war as much as he loved <laughs> Halloween. But uh, all right, so you, you got into that. But something I've always thought was interesting about you is you went to Yale. So I mean, it's like, it's, did your dad ever say, or your mother, or anyone be like, "Hey, you, you're wasting this Yale education with this movie stuff"? I mean, how do you go from being in Yale to deciding, "Hey, I, I know you did some writing for magazines and things like that," but to jump into acting? What was that? How, how well, did you get there? Jump. You know, I graduated in uh, 1974 uh, with an English major. And um, for the next, uh, let's see, a good 10, 12 years, uh, I worked as a writer in advertising, a freelance writer, a journalist. You know, I, that's basically how I made my dough. And it wasn't until 1986, so 12 years later, that um, uh, Chainsaw 2 knocked on my door. So for those years, uh, my parents still weren't, you know, all that big on, because I worked for the National Lampoon. Yeah. I worked for Rolling Stone, Interview Magazine, Omni, a bunch of different things. So I don't think they really saw that as much of a career either. And <laughs> frankly, it wasn't. But, yeah. uh, you know, it did, unfortunately, uh, you know, what, what really saved my bacon, this is mostly in New York City, was that, uh, you know, I had an apartment with a cheap rent and therefore I could, you know, do all kinds of odd jobs and things. And I think it was two eighty five a month. Oh, Woo. Yeah. Back yeah. in the day. So <laughs> back then. Really to, uh, yeah. I didn't have to, you know, walk the plank every, every month for, uh, to make the rent. So yeah. which part of the city uh, were you living in? Okay. Which part of the city? Uh, I lived on the Upper West Side, West 83rd, West okay. 87th, 163 West 87th. Excuse me. So were you a freelance writer for Rolling Stone or did you, were you working at the office and what were you doing no, there? No, no, no. I was freelance. And you know what I did was I, I started out because when I first got to New York uh, back in the late 70s, so maybe 78, um, uh, what happened was uh, 
for about a year, I did some couch surfing because I didn't have an apartment of my own. And so what I needed to do is to find a way to be creative, uh, but also, in, you know, keep writing and be creative without, you know, I don't know, for some reason, you know, because I was surfing on couches, I needed kind of a movable feast. So I ended up um, starting with the National Lampoon. I started doing uh, what I call photo essays. And um, it, that also, I did that for the Rolling Stone at the, at the very the end paper of the Rolling Stone would be like a, a series, a single or a series of pictures with kind of a funny caption. And that's what mm -hmm. I did for La National Lampoon. Uh oh, it's like Bill got froze there. No, he's he's just thinking really hard about that part he, <laughs> when he worked for National Lampoon. Give him a second. This is a great. This, I love what he's talking about. Okay, come back, come back. I need to hear more of this. He, he, he's coming back. Just give him a second. And the thing is, I love that he was he was getting paid to make funny captions, basically yeah. making memes back in the seventies is what he was doing. Uh, yeah. You know, and and sustaining on that. I mean, it's huge. It's like a, one of them was. Mm hmm. Oh, okay. did, he, did he leave? There we go. There we go. Yeah, he he, he plopped out. All right. Yeah, yeah, I'll, right I'll, I, I don't want I don't want to knock him out and him be like, oh, why'd you guys knock me out? Yeah, give you him know. a chance to. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, OK. Hold up. Services. Oh, let's see. Loading up. All right. There we go. I'm going to pop him back on. All right. Hey, yeah. Bill. All right. I, no. All right. Sorry. Et cetera. <laughs> I so I lost. Believe, <laughs> I cannot believe you didn't pay your cable bill. I mean, yeah. <laughs> what a time to not to forget to pay the internet. Uh, AT and T too. So you, know. oh. so you were you were just talking about uh, doing the photo essays in the back, which they actually did in that magazine for a long time. I, I recall seeing those style things in the back for a while, and then we lost you. You said you were doing something for National Lampoon. So can you pick back uh, up where you were? It. The, what I call the photo essays. And so I did a bunch of those for the National Lampoon. Um, I did them for, as I say, Rolling Stone and Interview Magazine. Uh, so that, that kind of kept me going. Uh, also, I wrote articles. Uh, you know, then I also had a, um, I was an English major in college, but also uh, uh, my minor was in uh, astronomy and uh, all things, things interstellar. I, I took a couple of courses called, uh, you know, you know, quasi, what is it, black holes and and, and uh, uh, black holes for the non-scientists. So oh, I had quantum mechanics for the non-scientists. So I did stuff that I, I was interested in science, but, you know, I, I certainly wasn't a, a physicist or anything. So um, when I got out, uh, one of the things that I ended up writing for was uh, Omni Magazine, which was, so I interviewed a bunch of scientists and wrote uh, articles. You know, I did a lot of urban sociology articles. I wrote about uh, subway graffiti artists. I, uh, I rode with the uh, guardian angels oh, wow. and wrote about them. You know, are they vigilantes or, you know, what are they? You know, and so I, I, I kept myself pretty occupied before I slid into, uh, you know, the uh, a lucky uh, acting career. So is the, the story true that you made a short film called Texas Chainsaw Manicure, and that's what got you pretty much the job for, for Chainsaw 2. Absolutely. Uh, that, is, that, is the, that is the story. I, I made a short film, um, the Texas Chainsaw Manicure, shot on Staten Island uh, at a place called Sonia's Hair Fashions, and um, had Leatherface, had a you know, girl under a dryer wanting a manicure, and out comes Leatherface and start sewing on her fingertips and she screams and passes out and they slap her awake and she goes, Oh no, no, no. Oh, oh. she has a fabulous manicure. <laughs> right. And she goes out and shows her husband played by me, um, in the pickup truck. And I was, I was made up and dressed as the uh, hitchhiker. So I right. had like the wine mark on my face and you know, the, the little raccoon wrist, wristlets, whatever else he had. And uh, she comes out and she goes, look, honey, I got the best manicure ever. I go, hey, that's great, honey. We should celebrate with some head cheese. And uh, I bought some head cheese for the shoot, which doesn't look very dramatic, but you know it's like 
scrotum, right. eyeballs. Eh, it's it's funky. Uh, but I did lick. I licked my little slab of head cheese on one of the takes. Oh. Uh, but uh, a friend of mine, I showed that to a friend of mine who happened to be a writer. He wrote uh, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, huh? among other things, in Doc Hollywood. So this was a friend of mine in L.A. when I was visiting. <laughs> Doc Hollywood. Yeah, that was a great movie, though. I liked that yeah. when I was a kid. That was a good movie. Yeah, well, he he, he said, I showed it to him because we were pals from school, and I showed it to him, and he said, Shit, man, you should, you know, leave me a copy of the manicure. And I, I'm right across the hall from Toby Hooper, who at the time was working with Steve on um, uh, come on. <laughs> I was gonna say Gremlins just jammed my mind. Um, you know, Toby Hooper, Steven Spielberg. What was that movie? Who framed Roger yeah. Rabbit too? No, 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 no. Uh, come on. Come now on, you wouldn't man. put me on the spot. It's a horror man. movie. Oh, my a God. Horror movie. We all know that. That, that Spielberg me. did? Yeah. Yeah. He was the producer. Toby was the director. It's not Gremlins. It's. Uh, uh, the, oh, uh, Critters? Jeez. No. <laughs> Critters, oh, wow. uh, you know, Critters was like great, a too. Family and their house is haunted. Beetlejuice. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> we, need some, we need some help from the fans out there. <laughs> 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 no, Poltergeist. Poltergeist. Yeah, I was going to say that because there's a part in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 where the, the national anthem is playing at the end of the, the station going off the air, and that was also the same one that played in Poltergeist. I don't know why I didn't remember. I'm sorry if that was insulting. I'm cutting off my microphone now. <laughs> now I'm going to read. For me, I'm, you know, I'm getting old, so you know, I, I can justify a few holes in the brain. But you guys, I don't know. I'm, we're not as young Wait, as we were. You might want to take some thinking. ginkgo biloba. Poltergeist <laughs> had, uh, had Pinhead, right? No, come on. Yes, stop yes, 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 it no, did not. You know who was in Poltergeist was Lou Perryman. And Lou Perryman, uh, who is one of the workers that comes in when the uh, when the furniture gets all stacked up in the kitchen. Right. Lou Perryman um, was also uh, LG in Texas Chainsaw 2. Lou Perryman. Wow. Hmm. R.I.P. Great guy. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, uh, so my friend, I gave my friend a copy of the manicure. He walked it across the hall to Toby's office and... Um, Gave it to Toby. Toby, this was, of course, it was on videotape, uh, like an, an, an ancient form of <laughs> media. Um, but uh, uh, Toby watched it and apparently loved it and brought in Steven Spielberg, who also watched it. They both loved the manicure. It's about five minutes long. And um, they especially loved the guy who played the hit. And uh, so my friend also got me Toby's home number told oh. me to give him a call in about a week. I did. Toby picked up the phone, which I l later found out was miraculous. He never answers his phone. And um, and I said, uh, hi, Toby, it's, it, it's Bill Mosley. And he goes, who? I said, it, me, <laughs> Bill Mosley, I love the manicure. And he said, oh, hell yeah, hell, Bill, yeah, I love the manicure. I said, oh, that's great. Uh, and he said, uh, who played the hitchhiker? I said, well, well, that was that was me. And he goes, well, hell, if I ever do a sequel, I'll keep you in mind. And uh, he gave me his address, told me to stay in touch. So I sent him a postcard. And that was all I ever heard from him for the next two years. That was 1984. And then uh, all of a sudden, one night in early 86, the phone rang, and it was somebody who identified himself as Kit Carson. And I knew that from, you know, page six, the gossip columns, he was married to Karen Black. He was kind of a a you know, celebrity guy and a, and a right. writer. And he uh, said, this Kit Carson, and uh, I just want to know where to send a copy of uh, Texas Chainsaw 2. And I, you know, I think, I think my impulse was to say, who is this really? Because it sounded like a good <laughs> really in any kind of mood for it. Who but uh, but it, the, the, I could tell because the, the, in the old days when it was long distance kids and you had a phone to your ear, you could hear a sizzle, and that was long distance. And uh, the call was definitely sizzling, so I knew it was not a local prank. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I gave this guy my address, and he, sure enough, he sent off a copy of Ch Chainsaw 2. And uh, those are back in the days, pre-internet, so you couldn't, you know, you know, attach it with a PDF. You had to uh, right. actually 
put it in the mail. And I got it and read it. And he had told me to keep an eye on that chop top. And I did. And I, I, and I, and I was like, shit, man, this is a big part. And yeah. uh, it was like one of the family members. And uh, so I called him back and I said, I, I let, this script is hilarious. He goes, really? You think so? I said, oh, yeah, man, this is fantastic. He said, what do you think of Chop Top? I said, oh, it's, it's fucking awesome. And, uh, and so he said, well, we'll be in touch. So I figured, you know, I don't know what that meant. You know, to me, that meant like maybe they were going to fly me out from, from New York to L.A., you know, maybe or even audition me. I wouldn't get the part, but at least I get a free trip to and from uh, Los Angeles. And uh, the next couple of days, I got a call from the Canon Films Legal Department. Ooh. And they said, uh, yes, Mr. Mosey, do you have an agent or do you want to negotiate your own contract? I'm like, what? And I had met an agent from William Morris at a Christmas party a couple months earlier. So I called her up and said, would you, you know, like to negotiate this? She said, sure. You know, it's free money for her. So she calls me back and she goes, uh, well, I've got some, some good news and some bad news. And I said, well, what's, what's the good news? And she said, well, they want you for this part, this part of Chop Top in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And uh, I said, well, God, that's pretty amazing. That's, that's awesome. And, and I said, well, what's the bad news? She said, well, um, they're only going to offer you uh, like SAG scale. And at the time, as a freelance writer in New York, I was maybe making 250, 300 bucks a week, you know, on average. Right. And uh, and I said, well, geez, scale, it just sounded like a fish. Yeah, sounds so, terrible. Yeah, what's that? how much is that? She said, oh, I don't know. I think it's 16, 1700 bucks a week. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, me. And, Are you sure they can't do better? What? And then, uh, and then she said, uh, you know, and, you know, like as if that weren't bad, here's here's the real bad news. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah. And she goes, uh, because there's a makeup and there's some kind of plate in your head, uh, they're going to want you to shave your head. I went, okay. And she said, so I told them that you were a working actor and that uh, this would really set your career back. So they've agreed to pay you $5,000 to shave your head. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's, like, it's like winning. It's like, you know, pulling the right number on. What, know, was, what was her cut on the five grand? What did she get out of that five grand for your head shave? Uh, 10, 10%. No. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What a deal. He did get 10% of everything, pretty much. Um, and so uh, that was the beginning of my film career. You know, did you buy life. anything lavish when you got that? Like when that when that windfall was coming, what did you go buy? What was your yes, thing? The one, the one thing I did do that was very lavish was I took my girlfriend at the time, a beautiful model, and she came from New York to visit me on the set in Austin, Texas, outside of Austin. And uh, we went out to dinner one night and, you know, there was some kind of a big faux French restaurant, Texas style, not too far from where I was staying at the Brook Hollow Motor Inn. Ooh. And uh, so we walked over to this fancy French restaurant. We had a wonderful, expensive meal. And then uh, then they pushed the drink cart by. And the drink cart had all kinds of very fancy and famous liqueurs and brandies and stuff. And they had... Uh, and, and my girlfriend wanted a uh, some port. And so they had some dusty old spiderweb bottle. And Uh-oh. they said, uh, and I said, yeah, how much, how much is a glass of that port? They said, uh, oh, it's $100, sir. I said, oh, yeah, yeah sure, okay. And then I said, uh, and I'll have some uh, some of that Napoleon brandy, because it had like a bottle with, looked like a kind of a crown, just like with glass, <laughs> little blobs on it and everything. Very fancy. And I said, how much is, uh, how much is that? And they said, uh, well, that's five hundred dollars for a snifter, and I Ooh. said, "Yeah, yeah, I'll have one of those." Too. So we we had wow. you know, hundred dollars worth of drinks there, and then uh, the waiter came by and said, "Everything okay?" And I said, uh, "Yeah, we'll we'll have another round." <laughs> ah. That was <laughs> that was my only extravagance. <laughs> you're looking Man. at her. You're like, you better finish every drop of that <laughs> pour. Can, can I take the empty bottle home with me? Is there something? <laughs> A consolation prize, perhaps. Yeah, that was yeah. lick the glass. That was it. That was my that was my one you know tip of the hat to uh, lavish life. I mean, you stole that movie. That was uh, that's your movie. I mean, more than anything, because I was like, 
I wish there had been a part three that would have gave us his backstory more, you know, see where he, he basically, cause he was supposed to be the twin brother, I believe of the, the hitchhiker. Right. And, and I, there was so much story there that could have been told. And I was like, man, I wish we could have got a little more of that because that really was that you stole that movie out from under everyone. And I mean, well, everyone. I, I got really excited because right after Chainsaw 2 came out, uh, is when I saw uh, Evil Dead 2. Mm -hmm. And I remember my girlfriend, after all those you know, expensive drinks, uh, you know, she ended up getting pregnant. No. <laughs> not, not, not from the drinks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, we had since moved to Los Angeles so that I could pursue my acting career, which, of course, was insane. Um, you know, and for all you people that want to move to L.A. and, you know, to pursue your acting career, well, you know, check it out, you know, uh, you know, somebody wins the lottery, I guess. But uh, anyway, so I had we, had we had come out kind of like, you know, Joseph and Mary, you know, pregnant. <laughs> the only thing we lacked was the it was the mule, you know, the burrow following the star west to Hollywood. And uh, we went to see um, Evil Dead 2, when she was still pregnant. And it was fucking great. I just thought, wow, this is fantastic. And in my head what I thought was, wouldn't it be great if Toby and Sam Raimi got into kind of a throwdown? So mm -hmm. like Texas Chainsaw 3, mother, you know, and then and then it was like, oh, yeah, well, how about Evil Dead 3, you know, and just kind of each of them trying to outdo the other. And so I wrote a treatment for, for Chainsaw 3 where the Chainsaw family has now moved, has relocated to New York City. And, um, and uh, let's see. Chop Top is now like a uh, a DJ, you know, and so he music is his life, and he's like spinning records and every very popular. Um, and then Leatherface uh, works for Parks and Rec in Central Park with his chainsaw, you know, trimming trees when he's not trimming people. And then the cook is the purveyor of a very fancy uh, Tex-Mex restaurant downtown. And Which one so, of us is going to jail, by the way? Who, who huh? was going to, which one of us was getting ready to go to jail? Was that you, Bill? Were you about to go to jail? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm coming for you. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. I down the street from a fire station. Oh, Engine okay. Company 61. Where um, are you now, Bill? Uh, Los Angeles. Yep, see, I'm still here. Um, are there a lot of fires around you? Uh, there are, actually. Yesterday we saw the uh, some of the, the smoke of the Bobcat fire. I thought it was I thought it was an enormous big storm coming, and then my younger daughter pointed out to me that no dad, that is smoke from the fire uh, burning the hills of uh, just uh, west of Los Angeles, east of Los Angeles. So yeah, they're still, they're still raging out here. When you talk about chasing that star and somebody has to hit the lottery once in a while, have you discouraged your children to a point yet that they're afraid or are you kind of just like backing off and waiting to see where everything ends up with, with the kids? You know, my uh, both both girls have been educated, so my my job is done. <laughs> right. Uh, my, my younger just graduated from UCLA about two months ago, uh, wow. via Zoom. By the way, she had her little cap and gown, sitting in front of the computer. It's kind of a sad state of affairs in 2020. But um, yeah, my older daughter went to uh, Bard College in upstate New York, and uh, my older daughter is a very successful fashion model. And um, so that is uh, that warms the cocktails in my heart. She drives a Tesla and owns her own house. So that's like way, way past dad. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm glad that, uh, you know, and she has enough property so that, uh, you know, when her mom and I, you know, can't lift the, the spoon of soup to our lips, maybe we can go out and live in a trailer on, you know, on her back 40. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Sure. The, younger, the younger girl is just starting out. And I, I don't envy her at all because she's just, you know, this. she just graduated and it's like, hello world, here I am. And it's like, you know, people with masks and shutdowns and lockdowns and nobody's hiring and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a brave new world, but, uh, you know, I happy if they want to go into acting or any kind of showbiz. You know, they have my blessing. Now, uh, I know I that you they, they tell me what to do. So it's not like oh, well, they're. I mean, of course, they're your I'll daughters. Tell you what, kid. You know, they so, don't like. 
I, I know you're huge into music. I know you, you, you've done stuff in the past with, with Buckethead, and you've done some stuff with Phil Anselmo with the, the Phil and Bill uh, stuff, which I was amazed by when it came out because I remember seeing the video for Dirty Eye, yeah. and I'm like, wow, this is really good. This, it's, it's better than I expected. I'm not trying to put Bill down, but wow, this is really good. I know Phil's chops. But wow, I'm very impressed by uh, your work on it as well. So, I mean, when you go to collaborate with someone like Phil, did you go into it a little apprehensive? Because he, I mean, he does have a little bit of a, a history, having uh, run-ins with uh, bandmates and stuff like that. How, what was that experience like for you? It was a lot of fun. I actually had, you know, because I had known Phil from, you know, the, the circuit. He had come to a bunch of uh, the same conventions I went to. And uh, we became pals Actually, we became pals like a couple of years before Phil and Bill, uh, Bill and Phil, excuse me. Um, when uh, I was called at the last moment uh, to interview him for something called artistdirect.com. And they were doing some series where actors and musicians interview each other. And so I was tapped to go interview Phil um, because he was a big horror movie fan. And so, um, so I went and, and interviewed him as he interviewed me. And it turned out that he basically knew a lot more about horror movies than I did, and certainly a lot more about music. So it was kind of like me going, gee, yeah, huh? Whoa, well, what do you think about that? So we became good friends. He liked me, and I, I liked him a lot. And, uh, and so over time, we'd see each other. He'd come into town with the band and give me a pass and everything. And, uh, and I kind of bugged him a little bit saying, you know, hey, we should get together and, and do something. And, uh, and it's kind of like bugging Paul McCartney to play bass in your garage band. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you really could use a Hoffner Beetle bass. Um, but anyway, finally, one time I, I bugged him. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't merciless um, and uh, I wasn't too annoying, I guess, because one time I just said, hey, man, you know, still open to jumping and doing something with you. And he said, okay, man, you know, I got four days next week. And, uh, you know, because my, my girlfriend's parents are gone and I got to go on and do something else. But I got four day window. So if you can get down here, because he lives in the woods north of uh, New Orleans. And uh, he said, you can get down here. We'll, we'll see what we can do. So I gathered up some lyrics some poems and lyrics that I had, stuffed them in a suitcase, got a plane to New Orleans rented a car, drove over Lake Pontchartrain, found his house in the woods, and uh, showed up. And uh, the first night we kind of chatted and watched some horror movies. He actually showed me a really weird movie, uh, black and white. It was uh, Dracula for the, uh, for the for deaf, deaf and dumb people. It's called hmm. Deathula, D-E-A-F-U-L-A. -E no you way. Can check it out. It's, uh, it's there on YouTube, <laughs> Deathula. And so we watched Deathula, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm out of my lead here, man. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, we, uh, we, the next day we, he went over some of the lyrics and things, and he started working on the music with his engineer. He has a studio right on his property. And um, the, the, the third day of the four, the fourth day I split, the third day of the four, um, uh, the night before I had had some bad gumbo. And so uh -oh. I was up all night, you know, retching and puking and everything. And so uh, morning, I felt like my throat was scratching. This was going to be my big vocal day. And so uh, what I did was I ended up uh, driving, getting up early and driving over to um, Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> and I got myself, you know, some yogurts because I knew yogurt would be soothing. And also I take singing lessons in half for about the last 20 plus years. And uh, my singing teacher had reminded me that when you're doing a lot of singing, instead of drinking water, which, you know, which is, you know, cools the throat, but doesn't coat. You know, if you want to, if you want to coat your throat, apple juice. Ah. So, um, so I, you know, got a six pack of treetop apple juice cans, came back and uh, went into the studio and, and did all the vocals in one, that one day. And uh, at one point, um, you know, I think somebody, you know, lit a bowl or something. So, you know, it was like a small closed studio and somehow I, I got 
squeezy. And I remember running out and saying, uh, hold on just a sec, uh, you know, in the middle of a take and uh, running outside, puking in the bushes. You know, I had a beard, so I'm wiping chunks off my beard, oh, you know, and walked back in, and, you know, got that mic. And that's when I thought, man, I am a, you know, I am a real, where is that? Can, yeah, can, I'm a real <laughs> rock and roller. You know, can we go, so cute. Can we go back to Count Defula real quick? Yeah. What, what, so what is the, what is the <laughs> was there <laughs> actual dialogue? Was it like, I want to dunk your blood? No. Or like, what was the, what would they say? Deaf. It's for deaf people. So there's, so there's, sign, language. there's sign language. Oh, it was silent. Oh, I thought it was like Dracula. He thought was all deaf. the actors were. Yeah, were, I thought they were all, all deaf. The actors, yes, the actors are all deaf as well. So the whole the whole idea is that it is it it's a you know a movie a horror movie by the deaf for the deaf and uh, check it out deaf you know I got to look it up and watch it now yeah really yeah. I mean I wasn't trying to be disrespectful just now by the way I hope I didn't offend uh, you were you were absolutely offensive I can't believe you're here I want to throw you out um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3D was the is the best Texas Chainsaw remake they've done. As far as I'm concerned, because one, it, it gives a whole nother story than all the other rehashings. And it's just it's so much better. I mean, what are, what was your opinion of the uh, Texas Chainsaw 3D? Hey, the check's cleared. And I didn't get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> has there has there ever been a movie that you've done that, you know, so much stuff ends on the, the editing room floor. Right. And you did some crazy scene. And you were like, oh, that's totally going to be in the movie. And you go back and you see that this part is, is out of it. And you're like, well, why do we even shoot that part? Has there ever been anything in, in any of the movies that you've done like that? Not that I regret. Um, I'm sure. You know, there's always because, you know, for me, when I, when I see a movie for the first time that I've been in, uh, it really is almost like, um, you know, looking at vacation pictures. You know, you remember right. like, oh, I remember that day and. Oh shit, man! I remember I did that scene a, a different way, and that was the one I preferred. And they used this one instead. So you got to kind of go through it. It's kind of a trip down memory lane, and you also get to see just um, how good the director and the producer are in what is really the make or break phase of any movie making, which is post production. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you could do some, you know, kick ass acting. It could be like, you know, the crew could be crying as you're holding your, you know, dying mom or, you know, whatever your deal is. And then, you know, they could end up uh, putting some polka music to it <laughs> when it comes out. You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, so there's a whole different, you know, it's a whole, they, they can really do some crazy stuff. Um, so I don't really, you know, I don't really have, I mean, you know, in uh, Three from Hell, Rob Zombie's Three from Hell, um, mm -hmm. I did have an extra line in, um, you know, when I when we see Otis uh, at first in the in his jail cell. Okay. And I'm going, uh, you know, did you miss me, America, and doing all this stuff. And at the very end, uh, you know, I talked about I'm just like a, a poor little, I'm like a little turtle with, under a plastic, little plastic palm tree. And, uh, you know, like when you were kids, you had like a little tiny turtle and a, like a little plastic turtle bow with a green plastic palm tree, right. at least I did. And, uh, you know, and I was, that, that really touched me because I, I had a bunch of those little turtles. All of them got away and crawled off and hid and then died, and stunk up my bedroom. <laughs> so I'm sorry to those little turtles. And of course you would, you would feed them uh, ant eggs, dried ant eggs. And so I, I loved that little turtle and I loved having that as part of my, my monologue, but uh, it got snipped. So that I was sad about. Um, I don't think it really made that much difference in terms of right. you know, the character, but you know, for me, it meant it, something to you. Yeah. Personally, it was I kind of a personal thing. Out. Yeah. Uh, has there ever been a role that you've passed on? You're like, and then someone else may have done it and you're like, God, that, that could have been me. I, I should have done that movie. I felt like that was a bad role. Did you ever do that? I don't, not, not really a movie part, but, um, Many years ago, uh, my buddy Frosty was friends with a group of uh, cartoonists. And, uh, and my friend Frosty said to me, hey, they want you to uh, be the voice of this character. And, uh, and I went, oh, okay. 
And they said, yeah, we want, you know, and it's like, it's going to be like uh, Peter Lurie. And I was like, uh, huh. And they, you know, they played some stuff. And somehow I got it in my head that, that doing this character would be tough on my throat. Okay. You know, I, just, I don't want to talk like this, you know, whatever, whatever, Peter, that's a little more, you know, two gun Gonzalez and Peter Lorre, but whatever. In other words, I wanted to like, you know, I, 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 I so I passed anyway, whatever it was, uh, because I thought it wouldn't be, you know, I, I wasn't really that excited about it. Well, it turns out it was Ren of Ren and Stimpy. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. So, they wanted these, they ran, ran, you know, and I, and I was thinking that's going to hurt my throat if I do it a lot. And of course, then it turns out to be Ren and Stimpy. It's like, oh, man. So, you know, you, there, there's some, you, there, there, we that all have. That would change things quite a bit for you. Yeah, things would have been a little bit different, uh, especially that merchandising. If you got a piece of that, man, they, they sold that stuff everywhere forever. I mean, even now. Even now, yeah, there's yeah. still uh I know I want to get to a couple of real quick questions from uh, some fans that were in here earlier. Uh, somebody had asked about the scene in Devil's Rejects where you're uh, basically using your pistol as a uh, different kind of weapon in the scene in the hotel room. He wanted to know uh, how uncomfortable was that? How did that you know, feel? Was it over the top? I mean, what was that like? Well, look at it. You, you froze Bill with talking about Ren and Stimpy. He's he's sitting there. He's like, you he's, son of a... There he's back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. There he goes. He's back. Oh, we got to hurry up and finish this. Talking Happy about uh, firearm dildonics. Take it yes. away, Bill. When you know, Did you hear the question about the guy had asked about the uh, scene in Devil's Rejects in the hotel room with your... Uh, and using the pistol in a, a certain way uh, that uh, we won't really talk too much about here. But... Um, he wanted to know if that was uncomfortable, if that was a scene that was tough to do, or what your thoughts were on that scene. It was, yeah, it was, it was uncomfortable. But but sometimes the uncomfortable scenes are the most exciting and demand the most, you know, the most presence or the best acting. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, it was scary as hell. I was, um, uh, you know, and I I owe so much of that, the success of that scene, the power of that scene to Priscilla Barnes. Yeah. I mean, you know, because I remember telling Rob that, uh, you know, this scene is going to be already heavy. And I said, I, I just I don't I've never met Priscilla. I just, you know, I don't want to have to help her through the scene as well as, you know, myself. And and he said, uh, I, I really wouldn't worry about that. <laughs> I'm like, OK. And uh, he was right. man. he, you know, he, he cast her. I mean, uh he knew what he was doing because uh, Priscilla was fantastic. And we ended up doing that scene probably 20 times. Goodness. Because, you know, when you're doing uh, uh, an ensemble moment like that in a room with, you know, a couple of people on a bed and a dead body on the floor and me and Priscilla, um, you have so many different shots. You've got over my shoulder on her. You've got over hers on mine. You've got a two shot of the two of us. You've got a master of everybody in the room you've got a shot from the camera that's looking down from the ceiling and then each of those shots has a bunch of different takes because maybe you sound is screwed up on one take or you flub a line so you put all that together man and you end up doing that a lot of times and each time we did that it was different uh, i was very exciting priscilla was really happening that day i was scared and happening that day so it was just one of those things. It, it felt very naked, uh, and it felt like really, you know, sometimes when you're acting, it feels like you're on the slippery tightrope, and uh, you know, you're walking over the alligator pit. <laughs> you know, so you know, you end up um, being very, you know, motivated, uh, but also, you know, you know, there's a lot of danger involved. So, uh, but it was, it was scary. Uh, and it's scary, too, because, you know, sometimes in a horror movie, if you're sawing somebody with a chainsaw, we all know, at least those of us making the movie, that maybe there's not a chain in the chainsaw. Or if it is, it's made of rubber. I mean, it's so there's a lot of stuff that looks scary that isn't real. Um, that scene, there was no there was nothing between me and Priscilla. That was mm. that was real. That was right there. You know, rubber meets the road, as they say. Right. And uh, well, we did it 20 times. And each time it was really exciting and different. You're and saying what I think you're saying, what you just yeah. said. 
I mean, basically, he's got the gun. It's in her underwear, and that's it. There's nothing in. That nothing was real. In, when he when he smelled the gun, he said, "Hey, your your girlfriend's stink is still in his gun." He he really meant it. I mean, it's still there. Well, you know, and I and that was not in the script. When you uh, ad libbed that, I get in. No, I get in the truck and I take Banjo and Sullivan to the to find the guns, quote unquote, and. Um, and then uh, we had a, you know, I parked the van and then we have a long walk to start, you know, where the guns are. And there had there was nothing in the script. So Rob came up to me and said, you know, we need something. So why don't you say, um, uh, is that your wife's pussy stink on on my gun? And uh, and I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Yale man. I was like, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, just go ahead and say it. I went, okay. And so, uh, you know, I say that to, you know, to Lou Temple. And uh, and then I, I ad-libbed, uh, hope it don't rust the barrel. <laughs> so everybody, you know, we all got into that. And um, yeah, but that, and then of course that becomes, you know, one of those famous lines. <laughs> but uh, that was, yeah, that was and totally that was, improv. That was totally and, that, and that's before you utter, which to me is one of the most famous lines in a horror film or really in any, any film, me and my wife say it to each other all the time, uh, where, where you're about to kill him and you, you pull your hair back and what do you say? I am the devil and I'm here to do the devil's work. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you know what? That was the million dollar puff of wind because that was a, it was a hot day outside of Lancaster, California. It's everything is hot. We're in a, that, that, that location was a, it was an abandoned chicken farm. And apparently the owners of the chicken farm, I don't know if they went broke or they went crazy because they just walked off and left the chickens. So the chickens oh, wow. all starved to death and then they just kind of mummified and all of that was just like chicken dust. <laughs> so oh my God. <laughs> already it was, you know, bad juju. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, uh, I'm standing there, there's not a breath of air in the whole county. And I'm standing there, and uh, looking down, and some wind kind of blows the hair, just this, you know, God wind blows the hair so that I have to pull my, you know, my hair back and say that line. It was it really, it was, it was amazing. Now, sometimes you see that in a movie where you'll see the bad guy and, and a fly will land on his cheek and then fly off. <laughs> you know, that's just, that's just luck. Yeah. Unless you have a really, a trained fly or a really good special effects person. <laughs> Uh, but you know, every once in a while that happens, and that's that's what we call movie magic. It definitely was. And now you see everybody uh, who's in the horror movies has that tattoo. I mean, is it is it ever weird you out? We see people constantly getting either uh, Chop Top or Otis somewhere on their body, and some of them are really good, and some of them are really bad. And you'll see them. You know, oh my God! I can't believe you poor child. What happened to you as a kid? Uh, no, I, I, I honor it, and I try not to be an asshole. There you go. <laughs> because the last thing you want to do is just go like, "Hey, look at my you know, my Otis tattoo," and then Otis turns out to be an asshole. It's just like you know, uh, you know, you just kind of want to scrape it off. So I, I honor that because uh, that's that's a lot of pain and a lot of expense. So I don't want to be the guy that uh, that bums out the Otis tattoo owner. No, it's 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 a really big thing. Um, I saw that the uh, animated film that you're in, the uh, To the Last Death, is coming out October sixth on Blu-ray. Um, I mean, it's it's very good. Everything I've seen on it is very good. Um, when you do a role like that, which just voiceover work, do you prepare the same, or is it is it even tougher to do because you're not working off someone else? Uh, you know, you just, you know, basically you might want to rely on the director a little bit more, but, uh, yeah, that's what I do. I just, I just go in, you know, usually you've talked about it ahead of time. Um, so I just go in and, you know, go into the booth. I love ADR. I love all that kind of stuff, that voice work. ADR, uh, is additional dialogue replacement, which means, you know, if something is screwed up, if there's like, you're giving a line of dialogue and there's a mechanical problem or maybe a helicopter overhead. So you have to revoice that part and you have to line it up and they, they play it back slowly. They give you a bunch of little beeps and then you have to match your lips saying, you know, Hey mom, how's it going? So you, you know, they, they get ready and then they go, boop, boop, boop. 
hey, mom, how's it going? And you just have to do it in cadence with your face. Wow. And uh, that, I, I love that stuff. And I love doing voiceover stuff and voices and voice work. So, you know, it, it ends up being a lot of fun. And, um, you know, it's not as hard because, of course, you have your lines on paper right in front of you. You have to memorize them. So That does yeah. make it a little bit easier. Uh, glad, glad to do it. Glad, glad for the work. All right. Last question. What is next for Bill Mosley? What's, what's the next thing we're going to see from you? Well, right before COVID, um, last November, December, uh, I was over in Japan doing a movie um, with Nick Cage. And it's oh, called wow. Prisoners of the Ghost Land. And it's directed by an, an incredible Japanese director named Sion Sono. S-I-O-N-S-O-N-O, -S -O -N -O. Sion Sono, who has done uh, Tokyo Tribe, uh, Suicide Club, uh, all kinds of amazing movies. If you look him up on IMDb, anti-porno, uh, hair extensions, tag, which is crazy, uh, all these amazing movies. And uh, this is his first uh, English language production. And, uh, and it's a really kind of a mashup between cowboys and samurai. Ooh. And uh, it's very modern. It's kind of science fiction. And uh, I play uh, the governor. So I'm kind of the big, you know, I'm the, the bad guy. <laughs> so, the big baddie. The big baddie, yeah. But it's uh, really, really a lot of fun. And I uh, that COVID has slowed down the post-production. Um, and, uh, and also it's being done between... You know, the writer producer buddy of mine here in LA and, and Tokyo. So, you know, it's being done over, you know, T3 lines or whatever it is, satellites. Uh, but I have a feeling it's going to be fantastic. I have a I, feeling. I saw the next fast movie in color out of space. Yeah. Was, this, uh, it sounds amazing. I mean, you, you yeah. can't go wrong with when the, you merge those kinds of things Cowboy Samurai, you know, Nicolas Cage. I mean, come on. Yeah. Nicolas Cage is great. And it's very, very surreal. Yeah, so, and Sion Sono is such a great director. If you haven't checked him out, I would definitely check him out, you know. Suicide something, Club. Maybe. Something very funny. When you start talking about Japan, when I was doing some research the other day, a story had come up saying that you were in the upcoming uh, Godzilla versus Kong. Have you heard that rumor that you're in that film? What? Yeah. It's crazy. There was a great story about that, that and the the old story about when you wanted to be Freddy Krueger and, and things like that. So, you know, all those great rumors that bounce around and things like that. Well, uh, you know, Freddy Krueger was was funny because I think I think maybe somebody at some point said, would you ever want to play Freddy Krueger? You know, I, I suppose I said, yes. I mean, sure. You know, who wouldn't want to play Freddy Krueger? Right. right. And uh and then it then it became like you know he you know wants to play Freddy Krueger, you know, and it's like all this you know it gets a lot of uh, hot air in it, and uh, you know, and I I don't want to play Freddy Krueger uh, because you know there's Robert England. Yeah. You know, I mean, geez, he's, he is Freddy Krueger. Yeah. You know, no one like, totally beats yeah. Robert England. Yeah, no one else could ever play that part. I'm sorry, no matter who they get in the role, they can't play the part. That no. that is him. He is Freddy Krueger. Period. Yeah. Nothing yeah. more, and, you know. And Freddie, Freddie goes with Robert, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with that. And uh, yeah, but there, there are rumors, and I, you know, sometimes they're just slow news days. Um, you know, I, 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 I get it, uh, but it's like it's funny. It's like you know, would I, would, would I want somebody else playing Chop Top or Otis for that matter? No, you know, it's like your, it's your character, man. It's like, uh, yeah, it's like a family member, so. <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to do that. I did though. I did uh, play Mayor Buckman in uh, the sequel to 2001 Maniacs, and Robert had played Mayor Buckman in 2001 Maniacs, mm -hmm. and I played Mayor Buckman in the sequel. So I, I have that. followed in his footsteps. Uh, real quick before we let you go, Not Sid Hayes. <laughs> yeah, Sid Haig, uh passed a year ago yesterday. Yeah. And what a talent. What a guy. I mean, when I look for films to watch, I always look for anything that has Sid Haig in it, Bill Mosley, uh, Kane Hodder, or Tony Todd. 
it, I feel like anytime I can find a movie with one of those guys in it, I'm finding something good. Um, what is your favorite memory that you can think of right now of you and Sid Haig? Well, they're all, I, I, I like them all. I mean, Sid was a great traveling buddy. We did a lot of conventions together. Uh, we sat at uh, our tables were usually together or side by side at so many conventions. And um, it was funny until Three From Hell finally got some traction a couple of years ago. Uh, for years, uh, someone would come to my table and say, uh, is there going to be a sequel to The Devil's Rejects? And I would stop everything and I would turn to Sid and I would say, Sid! And he'd go, what? I'd say, is there going to be a sequel to Devil's Rejects? And he'd say, no. And I'd say, why? And then we'd each count to three and in unison we'd say, because we're fucking dead. <laughs> well, as it turned out, I guess we weren't. <laughs> you weren't quite dead. Not quite there. Um, is there any plans? Have you heard anything from Rob that y'all going to do anything else? Will, will Otis ever see the screen again? Don't know. I hope Don't so. Don't know. But, uh, you know, uh, the last I saw of Otis, uh, he and Baby and, uh, and uh, Foxy and the three-legged dog were, were doing fine, you know, heading off into the sunset. Um, so, you know, we're, we're alive and well, so you never know. I can only hope. Bill, I want to thank you for taking time. I, I know this was almost kind of last minute for you and we, we had to get everything together, but I want to thank you so much for coming on. You are a true horror icon. You're one of the, the big names. I mean, the Mount Rushmore, your face is up there. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and uh, enjoy. I see you're going to go on a trip soon. So enjoy your trip soon, wherever you're going around the world. Uh, enjoy yourself. And we're going to have you on again. You, you are a fountain of knowledge, an endless stream of stories, and uh, a mountain I would like to climb once again. My pleasure, guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much, Bill. Thanks for having me. Sure. Uh, yes. yeah, yes. Thank you so Don much, sir. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone who joined us in the chat, everyone who is watching all over the platforms. Make sure you go and follow and me. He's all over uh, social media. You can find him. Uh, was it uh, Twitter? You, you got Chop Top Barbecue uh, website. You got. Chop, chop, it's at Chop Top Mosley. Right. So yeah, make sure you go over Twitter there. Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You still, you still do anything with the website? Uh, yeah. Oh, actually, shit. I, I, forgot, to, I forgot to mention uh, www.cursedcornfieldcomics.com. Oh my! Uh, it's, a, it's a collaboration. It's my sorry, my first comic book, and it's available for download at www.cursedcornfieldcomics.com. And uh, it's a collaboration with uh, an amazing cartoon artist named Simon Kudrensky, uh, who's done uh, Batman, who's done uh, 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 all kinds of amazing comics, uh, comic books so like Big Time DC. Uh, you know so. It's really good. And uh, this is our first comic. So you can go to that website and it's uh, name your own price. So you can either give us, you know, 10 bucks or buck 99. We don't like that. But <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I do have to plug that too. Absolutely. Cornfieldcomics.com. And everybody makes to make sure they go and check that out. Again, yeah, again, Bill, you're welcome anytime, my friend. Anytime. Thanks, All right, Thanks, Bishop. Sir. Knox, everybody, uh, thanks again. Make sure you uh, tune in Wednesday night. Tomorrow night, we're going to have our regular podcast. Friday night, we're going to be talking to Kane Hodder right here on the show. So make sure you join us for that as well. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>